First thing, hurting the church is a big deal. You don't want that on your record. In the last part of Romans, chapters 12 through 16, Paul is uh, teaching us how to live out the gospel together. And he shows us that living it out happens as we apply the medicine of the gospel to our minds, to our bodies, and to our churches. And with respect to our churches, what we've noticed is that Paul gives us some what we could call church killers, things to avoid. His negative and positive instruction both can be construed in this way that shows us, here are the things that if you don't want to mess up what God's trying to do through the church, just stay away from them, right? We looked at two of them last time. Number one was we compare and compete. I look at you and I think I'm either better or worse than you, but I've created a context of competition. And wherever there is competition, there is not compassion. We're no longer part of the same team uh, with a shared mission. We, we are against each other. Uh, so whoever's looking down on whomever, looking down on them, uh, Paul, you know, talks about how, no, like, get rid of it. Uh, then the second thing he said is we love only some people. And he teaches us this by talking about how we're called to love all people. Uh, and he just goes through a bunch of different types of folks and calls us in various specific ways uh, that pertain to those relationships to demonstrate love, agape, selflessness, seeking the good of others. And today we're going to look at uh, the third and fourth that we see in the, the rest of uh, this section of Romans chapters uh, 14 and then, and then 15. Uh, the, the third one um, is that we would let our opinions and preferences drive us. That's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time on. Let me uh, say a couple things about the fourth one, that we try to go it alone. This part is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm just going to um, mention it, point out a couple things, and then, and then spend, like I said, most of our attention on here. Uh, you, you can't do it alone. And chapter 15, verses 14 through 33 are a pretty fun, interesting um, section where we get kind of a window into the life and thinking of Paul about his own ministry. And this is actually where he's pretty subtle about it because he's following proper conventions and not being offensive, but he's actually asking for support. It's kind of a, this is the support raising part of Romans. Remember, the purposes are clarify the gospel, unify the church, uh, prove God's righteousness. And then also, we haven't talked about this one as much. Support, raise some support. His goal is uh, that he wants to finish up his ministry in the East, and then he hopes to come to Rome, spend some time with them, but he doesn't want to stay there. He wants Rome to serve as a sending church, to assist him on his journey, is how he puts it, to Spain. He wants them to send him with resources and to serve as kind of a home base for this westward mission in Spain and the surrounding areas. So here we see, by Paul's example, don't try to go it alone. If you do, you're going to create problems for yourself and probably some others as well. Uh, but we're going to focus our attention on number three, let opinions and preferences drive us. This is chapter 14 and the first part of chapter 15. Now, uh, newsflash, if you stick around the church long enough, you're going to find somebody to disagree with, okay? Like, this is something that we all recognize is, is pretty, pretty obvious. If you spend enough time in church, you and somebody else are going to see things differently. You're not going to like how they approach things. They're not going to like how you approach things. And sometimes these are issues that matter, things, you know, doctrinal things that the Bible's clear on and some people just uh, or believe the wrong things or, or um, you know, lifestyle things the Bible's clear on. Some people just do the wrong things. No, we're talking about like style preference stuff, you know. You're not going to like the way this particular group likes to worship. And they're not going to like the way, honestly, that you try to worship. You're going to disagree. And as a result, you're going to experience, here's some of your favorite word, conflict. That word makes, um, <clears throat> makes some of your mouth water because you love a good fight. But for most of you, that's not the impact the word has on you. It makes you want to want to play hide and seek and find a really good spot that no one could find you in until the whole thing is blown over. But you're going to find yourself in conflict. Now, conflict can result typically in one of three things. Uh, in the church anyway, and, and often in other contexts as well, sometimes it results in separation. You, uh, somebody leaves. You might have a whole church split, the division, or it could just be some stay and others leave, or you just like totally avoid each other. You separate. That's one uh, scenario. Another scenario is uh, where the conflict is resolved, and you have peace. Obviously, we would all look at that and say, you know, that's... Um, 
That's what we want. We want peaceful resolution of our conflict. But a third thing that can happen is you just sort of live with this low-grade simmer of tension and bitterness right beneath the surface, you know, and it usually expresses itself. It boils over in passive-aggressive text messages and those sorts of things, or if you were born after 90, subtweeting. So you have, uh, we'll call this fake peace, where people look like they're getting along, but in reality, no, not so much. It, it's a fake peace. If we're going to be the church, if we're going to be the people who live together in love in such a way that God's own character is manifested to the world and they can see the beauty of his gospel, we're going to have to find a way to disagree well. We're going to have to find a way to approach conflict from the standpoint of peace. And the good news is Paul gives us just what we need, at least in terms of like the ideas in our head, in chapters 14 and 15 in order to live this out. Now, remember their situation. The Jews and Gentiles, uh, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians trying to live together. Uh, the Jewish Christians left for a while and then came back, and now you've got these different mindsets. Now, I, I should be clear, I don't think it was like all the Jews on one side, all the Gentiles on the other. It doesn't seem like it worked out that way. But there were these two basic approaches to things like, you know, the law and how it should be interpreted. There was what we might call the Jewish interpretation. And some Jews would have been on the other side, but just for the sake of simplicity, this is the idea that, you know, the law is an authority for us. We have to follow it. We need to do what it said. Uh, Paul calls these folks with very sensitive consciences, he actually calls them the weaker folks. On the other hand, you have what he calls the strong. And these are those who are looking at it going, no, like you're free to follow some of the law, but God hasn't asked us to do all of those things, so stop with the lists of rules. He's freed us to discern right from wrong, and they take a little bit more of a looser approach to the law. So these are the, this is the tension that they're living with. That's their situation. Our situation is all subcultures have codes for how you do life. They have a, a culture for how you approach pretty much everything, including how you approach certain aspects of worshiping God, of following Jesus, how you'd prefer, you know, to, to do the things that aren't clearly stated in Scripture, such as how we're supposed to go about worshiping, uh, what the services should look like, when should they be, those kinds of things. And eventually, if you're doing church well, subcultural codes will collide. I, I, hope, you, I hope you hear me say this pretty clearly. Conflict is not always a sign of bad things. Sometimes it's a sign of really good things. Now it can be a sign of inward backbiting and a lack of outward focus and mission drift, but sometimes it's a sign of missional success because you're actually reaching different kinds of people and you're trying to follow Jesus together. So don't see conflict as an enemy to always be avoided. See it as a situation, an opportunity in order to demonstrate the way of Jesus more clearly. It comes from the right kind of growth. Now, one quick aside, I don't want to get on a tangent, but I also want to protect us from ways we could misread this portion of Scripture. When we talk about the disagreements and the opinions and preferences in chapter 14 and 15, this doesn't apply to stuff that Scripture's made clear. You're not allowed to say, you know, well, it's just my opinion. You know, take, for instance, I don't know what examples to use, but take universalism, the idea that in the end all people will be saved. The Bible doesn't teach this. So you're not allowed to just say, well, there's room for disagreement on it. Or, you know, some of the conflicts in our churches with respect to homosexuality and different things like that. You're not allowed to just say, well, I mean, agree to disagree. No, like, on some things, the Bible teaches what the Bible teaches. So we're not talking about that stuff. You're not allowed to use Romans 14 and 15 as a way of affirming your positions that really you believe probably in large part because it makes it easier to engage our particular culture. Totally get it. And we always all want to be wrestling with the text. So even if I'm not on those particular issues, uh, don't be tempted to misuse this section. We're talking about uh, things where Scripture is legitimately silent, where the Bible's left things open, stuff like what foods you eat and, and, and what days you celebrate or don't, those kinds of things. A lot of things about life that uh, the Bible leaves open for our discernment. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. And Paul's instructions are chock full of wisdom. I hope you read chapters 14 and 15 slowly uh, with uh, one or more other people and that you just make a list of all of the things that Paul says and then you again ask Jesus, okay, where do you want me to start? Where do you want us to begin? How can we live this out? But I do see a couple of basic principles for na navigating disagreement on the non-essentials. Number one, I think Paul says, don't be driven by opinions and preferences. Th that's the heart of what he says. Don't be. 
just we we all tend to 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 overestimate our opinions. We treat our opinions like they're facts. I have the same tendency. We all have a tendency to to uh, think too highly of our preferences. We treat our, treat our preferences like they're God's standards. <laughs> A lot of times, no, they're not. They're just the way you learn to do things or the way you like to do things. And so Paul here says, stop. Stop it. Like, don't judge people according to how you fill in the lines that the Bible leaves blank. You are not the Lord and master of all. Paul says this in the early parts of 14. You are not the Lord and master of all. Christ is. And he accepts people whose cultural preferences differ from your own. So don't make demands beyond Christ's commands. I find myself sometimes surprised at how laissez-faire, how loose Paul seems to be in this section. You know, you follow your conscience in a lot of matters of life. Paul says, let that be. Don't make demands beyond what Christ has commanded and don't reject those whom he has accepted. Paul is deeply concerned that we welcome folks with all sorts of differences. And if there are certain types of people that aren't welcome in your church, you got some work to do. So those are some things, of course, to discuss and put into practice. Paul says, though, don't be driven by opinions and preferences. And instead, you could probably see this coming, instead be driven by the example of Jesus, by the example of Christ. Prioritize the good of other people, you know, like he did. Serve them, not yourself, you know, like he did. It's so simple, isn't it? And yet, how many of our conflicts could be peacefully resolved if we all approach them with this mindset that I'm not in it to defend myself. I'm in this to try to demonstrate the spirit of Christ to you. Now, let me be clear. You are not required to follow other people's extra biblical rules. You're not required to submit to somebody else's code. You're free in Christ to fill in those blank lines how you see fit based on the wisdom that you've learned from the scriptures and from Jesus and from those with whom you follow Jesus. You don't have to do what they tell you to do. But that doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. That doesn't mean that you can just say, you know what, forget it. I'm not going to worry at all about you or what you're saying. I'm just going to practice things the way I want to practice them. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's like the example of Jesus. So by all means, enjoy your freedom in Christ, but don't abuse it. Enjoy your freedom in Christ, but don't become a slave to it so that all you ever do is all the stuff you want to do no matter what anybody else ever says. You're freed from the law, it's true, but not so that you can act without love, rather so that you can live in love and therefore live out the spirit of the law even when you don't have to keep the specifics of the code. Live like him. Like you have the most loving person in existence living in you through his spirit. Let him out. Live like Jesus by not demanding your own personal preferences, but instead laying yourself down for the good of another. I want to read a portion of this text just to make sure you know um, that this is indeed the kind of things that Paul's saying. I think chapter 15, the first few verses are probably worth taking a quick look, reading out loud together. Here's what Paul says. We who are strong. It's the people whose consciences aren't super sensitive. They, they don't just like, have to follow all the rules. They can discern, okay, this, not so much that. That's okay. Uh, we who are strong, he says, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me keeps going says for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide we might have hope in verse 5 may the god who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that christ jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the god and father of our lord jesus christ and don't be driven by opinions and preferences Instead, be driven by the example of Christ. Surely that gives you something to do. This is the kind of church I want to be a part of, probably yourself as well. So here are the questions I want you to wrestle with as we break this session. Here's one. Are there any unresolved conflicts that need your attention? Let me just highlight this word again. Conflict. There it is. Are there any unresolved conflicts that need your attention. If there are, tend to them. And the second question that I want to ask you is, if everyone in the church had the same attitude that you did, recognize what I'm saying. Recognize, I think, what this says. If everyone in the church had the same attitude toward disagreement that you have, 
what would happen then? If the answer is kind of ugly, then I think you know what you need to do next.